<laughs> so, right. Second time. Second time lucky, Simon. Uh, after me, after you've me been, being worried about it, and it happened to you. <laughs> um, you were talking about uh, having dabbled with podcasts back and forth yeah. in the last couple of years, and now trying to do, make it a bit more regular. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, partly because they're just good fun. You get to you get some fantastic conversations with people. This is the thing. Um, I think this is the thing with a podcast, not just well, podcast at the moment, but anything, anything really. In fact, no, no, it doesn't compare to anything really. So podcasts, yeah. When people are people are thinking about starting them up, I think people get hung up on. Depending on what you're doing it for, right? If it's you, you as an individual doing it, I say, so he's not doing it for a company, you're not doing it for an organization necessarily. But I think people get too hung up on uh, what they think people want to hear as opposed to what they want to talk about. Yeah. It's a rule I set myself really early. I'll, I'll speak to I'm inter- interested in thank you very much. And, not, <laughs> and, and try the game was like, try not to let the audience steer who you pick or accept as guests. Because yeah. just if I'm interested, then the guest should be interested, or might should, are probably going to be interested too. And um, what have you been? What what have you dabbled with in the past then? Um, well, it was um, obviously because my my line of work really I I work in mental health um, privately and kind of with the charity that I set up, and so it's all about trauma. I specialise in trauma, psychological trauma, not the physical side. Um. And it was about people's experiences of being in the military and that the, part of it was the transition piece. And that actually is, for, for many, is actually quite a traumatic experience, trying to, coming from one world into another and trying to trying to fit in and really, really struggling because the, the two worlds are vastly different in, yeah. in many ways. Um, and, the, and I think it's the mentality and, and the, the kind of the outlook on life that's, that people struggle to to adapt to it's very it's so different um still surprises me at times and i it's i mean i left the military itself in 99 so i've been out 21 years and i still struggle with it sometimes like what the f- fuck are you doing <laughs> just no idea um and, it, and there was so it was a mixture of civilian military uh, and how they got through these crappy experiences in life and what they'd learned from it yeah um so that was there was some real eye-opening conversations um really quite deep but with a lot of laughter in the process as well which was which was good when you're tapping your hands on the table it's yeah. coming through the mic is it ah <laughs> I, it's not it's not the noise it's the vibration through your phone i think are you on your phone your laptop i'm on my uh, on my computer yeah i think it's coming on through the it's the mic all right, uh, that, yeah. that's gonna be that's a challenge. Never mind your thirty-five miles and thirty-five day. You're gonna you gotta keep your hands off the table now for the <laughs> next hour. Um. So in term, so in terms of a regular podcast, what are you what are you thinking about doing, and how often? How often? Um. I'm th- well, certainly once a month. If I can get more than if I can get two a month, then great. I'd be happy with that. Um. I've got I've got a bit of a theme because as I start that that, that YouTube video I sent you a link to before starting this this moment of bloody madness um but i've 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 titled it my mental is healthy yeah so i'm gonna have i'm decided that that's gonna be the theme for my podcast Uh, am i mentally healthy my mental is healthy and my mental is healthy no (laughs) (laughs) yeah well 35 miles 35 days is going to be a challenge but i have to say i was thinking about a few few months back, 26, 26 marathons in twenty six days, and uh, and I thought I thought no, I, I not without any because I I'd been doing hardly any running up to that point, but not yeah. without any training. No way. I was just, I was just going to go into it. It was the Friday I was thinking about it. I thought about the Saturday, <laughs> and the plan was to start on the Monday with a full time job as well. Like what? The fuck? How mate? How did right? Your your mental health part of your life. So professionally and personally, how did all that come about? Because um, obviously, this podcast comes off the back of you telling me about some hostage hostage situations. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Uh, I am by by quite a number of my friends. I've been called a shit magnet over the years. 
uh, <laughs> I think for for good <laughs> for good reason. Um, my mental health, Christ, I lost the plot in '98 and decided uh, I'd had enough. This was just in the process of me leaving the the Royal Marines. How long did you serve for? Uh, 12, 13 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd, I was getting med- I was getting medically discharged. My marriage had just gone up the swanee, and I was losing my home. So all of, all the big things, all of, you know, all at the same time. And I I was I thought I'd become. Well, my best friend was Uncle Jack. Um, who we met for breakfast every day and then still doing fizz and still going out running and, and, and all that sort of stuff, but doing it on a raging hangover or on half a bottle of Jack Daniels. Um, and I got to the point, I just thought, oh, fuck this. I'd had enough. And I decided I was going to top myself. So it got to the point where I was sat on my sofa in my flat. Um, and uh, I, was, I was sat there with a, the barrel of a browning in my eye socket about to pull the trigger. What what was the issue? Just couldn't. I just couldn't. I couldn't cope anymore. I just way beyond my ability to. And it was emotional stress that I couldn't deal with. All the other shit was was fine, but it was just it was just this absolute tornado of uh, emotions I didn't understand, couldn't deal with, didn't know what to do with them. Just constantly feeling shit, and I was just I was just on a s- slippery slope. What was what was the catalyst for that coming on? What, 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 what? Well, initially, uh, my my marriage was 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 failing at that point, uh, or prior to this, uh, and then I was getting medically discharged because I I bugged my shoulder. Um, so losing my yeah. job, I and I loved it. Losing my marriage, um, wasn't so much the marriage as the fact that while I was away doing stuff, she was screwing somebody at work so uh but such is life ultimately she did me a huge favor so you know i'm married again two amazing kids and couldn't be happier so you know got to look on the bright side haven't you mm-hmm. <laughs> um so that that took yeah took, that took me on what i describe as um an oily hot teflon slide it was it was quick <laughs> Yeah, and it, uh, I mean, that kind of stuff, I've been through a divorce and, uh, and obviously leaving, and man, it is uh, it is not a pleasant experience, hardest stuff I've done, uh, hardest stuff I've ever had to deal with, and I didn't deal with it very well, you know, and there was other stuff. I mean, that's the thing, I think, um, with this, when we talk about trauma, and you know this, I'm preaching to the converted, but... I think a lot of people who don't have experience or understanding of it, and that doesn't necessarily mean experience with trauma themselves, but you know, just other other people having it, is that a they, they tend to think it it it's comes from a specific incident, yeah, uh, which is very often not the not the case, yeah. and they and then they think on the same side of that. Well, it's pretty much just the military you get. Who, who get for example, PTSD as an example of one you know mental health issue as a result of trauma. But you can get it from anything, man. I mean, the, the situation you're talking about there is a situation that could happen to any person in the world. Uh, in you know, any any person in the world, whether or not they, they served or not. You know, marriage gone, um, job changing. Really interesting point you made. In fact, it was on the bit that we had to. I we didn't <laughs> record properly because of my te- technical ineptitude. But I, I think it was in that where you mentioned. Um, oh. What did you mention? Oh my God! What did you mention? Found a brain fart. What was it, Simon? The, the oh, use. oh, oh! You, sorry. <laughs> it was leaving when you leave the military to go into a into city street. The yes. culture shock. The culture. The culture change. Yes. And, just, and again, go back to it's the same for civilian who's been in the same job for 20, 30, 40 years. Not the same. Very similar. 20, 30, 40 years. The same because it's not just the same job. It's the whole routine that goes along with that. The whole life, people's whole lives are often yes. focused around the job. To rip that away with redundancy or or a sacking or you know the the, um, the company collapses and you've got a similar issue. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's very much the same. And it's then throw alcohol on top. Yeah, and then throw alcohol into it as well. And you know, um, there are uh, people out there who who double with drugs as well um, to to cope. 
And yeah, I completely get it. You know, I, I'm, I, I t- talk to people on a daily basis, um, or have done, uh, who feel so embarrassed and guilty and ashamed that they they went to drugs and alcohol to 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 cope. Like, well, yeah, why? It's 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 an easy it's an easy option. That's not belittling it. It's it's an easy option to go to because it does temporarily. It is, you know, in a, in a short term, alcohol's actually a very good tool to help you get through stuff. It's just when it becomes a part of your way of life all day, every day, then it becomes a problem. But I, you know, I, I've had periods where I've, to cope with a really stressful time, I've, my alcohol intake has increased, but it's helped me to de-stress. It's actually helped me to get to sleep when I couldn't because I was complete insomniac. Um, but being the kind of people we are, you know, you, you know, when you go on deployment, you, you can't drink. So you just, you know, you, you, so I, I dealt with it like that, right. I'm now that bit's done. I'm, I'm feeling better. So I was like, bang, stop the alcohol done. <coughs> yeah. I think you'd be careful in that. I, 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 I agree with it in some ways. I mean, but, but I don't want to add. I, I, it's not to advocate that. Um, no, no. You shit that you're going out of alcohol. I mean, talking not about it from, you're talking about it from the height, from the benefit of hindsight where you've been yes. through that. Um, and uh, it's man, it's such a it's such a balancing act. To, if you if you're going to do it that way, it's such a, a hard balancing act to get it right and not slip off the slippery slope. That I, I I mean, I just stay away from it as much as I can. Um, I, I try and stay away from it as much as I can. Uh, but no, I tell you, I, I ju- I'm really conscious of it because I know uh, it's you know it'll, alcohol intake's fine, and then it can it can plummet as an alcohol intake plummets, and as that plummets, my mental health plummets, and then as my mental health plummets, something else goes pear shit because of it, like a financial issue or something yep. else, or a relationship issue or something else, and then it goes even further down, even yes. further down than the start of it for me would be an alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so don't. Yeah, yeah, it's horses yeah. for courses, isn't it? You know, for some people, it there it, it work. It, it's it's a good can, can cope with it perfectly well, and then just discard it. Come and go as you please. What did you do after you left then? Um, well, I when I left, I uh, my resettlement course. I did a, a, a personal trainer course because um, I wanted something. I loved fizz anyway, so I thought might as well do something I enjoy. So I had that in my back pocket, but um, I went on a circuit and I was uh, contracting um, as a, in, in human intelligence. So I, I would get mobbed and demobbed for different tasks. Um, so I kind of balanced the two and uh, it was it was good for 10 years, 11 years. Um, and in that in the latter part of those 10, 11 years, I managed to get myself kidnapped three, three times. Um, in three consecutive years, yeah. I mean, how stupid is that? How? Uh, what? How? I just explain it to me. <laughs> I don't know where to start, mate. <laughs> I know, I know. It's just, I was working in in West Africa, and I got caught up in. I think it was probably about seven or eight kidnappings that I was in the same location, involved in the in the in the aftermath of it. Uh, and two of those, I was actually kidnapped myself. So, what was it? Go on, talk, talk me through. I've, I've never spoken to someone who got kidnapped before. So relive, your tra- relive your trauma for me, Simon. See, that shit doesn't bother me. <laughs> it doesn't bother me in the slightest. I'm not fussed by it. It wasn't very nice when it happened, but, you know, you look back and laugh at it, especially the first time, because the, the first time, you know, it's, it's absolutely... When you're on a, on a, on a, a boat off the, off the Niger, Niger Delta and you get these... Um, you know, drug and alcohol infused gentlemen boarding this boat, and uh, it's a very persuasive argument when you don't have a weapon. And they're, they're you know, there's guys coming on with GPMGs, AKs, and and that, and you could you can see they're absolutely off their tits to give them the Dutch courage to go and do it in the first place. And it was it, it, that actually is quite fucking terrifying. But you get you get bundled into this boat bugger off in this speedboat back to shore get in the swamps and you get taken up the river into the swamps to the to where they live in the village oh so they took you off i, th- I thought for a minute there they held you captive on the boat because i t- i 
obviously I've had uh, my first guest was um, first ever guest was um, Jordan Wiley who got held captive on the boat. Yeah, yeah. Right, go on. So you got taken off. How off. many of them were there? That's about 15, 16 of them. How many of you guys were there? Uh, on the boat? Uh, Christ. Um, 50? Jesus. Mostly civvies. Yeah, all civvies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah all civvies. Um, so, got, yeah. Got, then got taken up to the... the up the river to this to this village, got out, and then when we got there, they're like, "Listen, sorry about that. Basically, it was kind of, well, not not for word, but sorry about scaring the shit out of you. Um, problems not with you. It's with the government, the oil companies, yada yada. We just we're just using you to get some money because we've got fuck all really in the grand scheme of things. So um, there's a hut there. There's mattresses. There's mosquito nets. There's malaria tablets. We'll feed you. We'll look after you. Don't worry. Nobody's going to hurt you." Um, he said that, Even malaria tablets. Yeah, they gave us everything. <laughs> Seriously. Jesus, I was not expecting this. No, it was like Hotel Delta. <laughs> <laughs> Who was telling you this? The leader. Yeah, just the the guy that took us. Uh, yeah, and it was it was it was quite surreal at the time. I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? Am I am I actually still asleep? So we had, to, and they fed us three times a day. They gave us, they, they said, we can't, we, he said, you'll have to drink beer because we haven't, we, the water's more expensive than the beer. So we need it for the kids, etc. So we had, I don't know if you've ever tried star beer in Nigeria. It's, it's horrible, no. chemically brewed shit. And it's bad enough when it's cold, but when it's warm, I'm like, oh my God. So the worst part of that first kidnapping was coming down off drinking beer warm shitty beer for nine days <laughs> it was honking oh i felt hey, horrendous you should someone should tell those guys that there are there are people in the uk blokes who would pay for that for a stag do they pay thousands <laughs> <laughs> they pay thousands mate right we'll get him we'll get him on the boat we'll tell him it's a cruise and then we'll pay these guys to kidnap us and we'll go and drink beer for the but we'll pay him extra so we get nice cold nice, nice cold, cold beer. beer yeah yeah <laughs> There's a business for you there. Are you still in touch with them? <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, I've not met them again since. <laughs> Jesus Christ. How long, you, how long was that for? That was nine days. Oh, that's long, man. That's long, man. I mean, you're making a joke. You're making light of it, but you never, you must have not known what was going to happen there. Like, no, no, not really. I mean, I was, when, from that first year when we got got there and there, because they took us in the middle of the night, got there, it was getting daylight. Um, and they said, listen, just chill out. He said, we're not worried about you going anywhere because you've got no idea where the fuck you are. So, which was very true. You know, I'm middle of the middle of the, the swamp in this village. I'm like, that. right. Yep. That's very true. No, no point in, um, you know, they said, well, let us, we'll look after you. Don't worry. Nobody's going to hurt you. And they were really nice. I even ended up, <laughs> I ended up. Servicing their weapons for them. <laughs> I was cleaning them out, de-rusting them, and tidying things up. And <laughs> what happened when you got? <laughs> How did you get released? Well, they got they got their money, and we we were it was basically a, a transfer from one boat to another. And um, uh, the like the capital of Bielsa State in Nigeria is a place called Yenagoa, and it's on this river. So. One boat came from one direction. We came from the other. Met bag of money into the, our boat. We got into their boat, and that was it. Off we went. Do you, do you know what the ransom was? I've no idea. No. So all that nine days, were you like constantly just speaking with them and understanding yeah. them, yeah, meeting just, the families? Yeah, yeah. I was chatting with everybody. I was playing football with the kids. I was <laughs> that is a bizarre story of a road. That is it's bizarre. Just, yeah, it's nuts. It's just, but it was, apart from that, <laughs> apart from the beginning and the end, the beginning being quite terrifying, because you didn't know what the fuck they were going to do at all, no idea, to being just mortally hung over at the end of it. Which was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was the nat- what's the nationality of the other uh, kidnappees? Uh, one, one Brit, one American. And what were the rest? That was that, that was that was it. It was just the three of us. I thought it was fifty. I think it's fifty. 
Oh, there, no, it's 50 people on the boat, but they only took three. Oh. Ah, right. What nationality were the people on the boat? Oh, Christ, there was, there was obviously, there's local nationals, there was Nigerians, um, there were, uh, Christ, what was there? There were American, Brit, uh, there was a couple of Kiwis, and I think, I think it was either Norwegian or Swedish, I'm not, I can't remember. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh... What happened after that? Did you go back, just go back to your boat? Yeah, but one. Well, uh, no, no, I got then got um, got a, a a chopper came picked us up, took us back to Lagos. Um, state got um, the people I was working for. I uh, we went to a villa, debriefed, showered, changed, cleaned up, and they took they took me out and got me absolutely smashed again and went for a Chinese. <laughs> Did the, uh, did, did the authorities not come and do an, uh, a review? Like, not a review. A, um, no, 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 no. Debrief? No. no. No, no, because, well, they were all there at the handover. Oh. Uh. <laughs> what What'd you do after that? Mate, you just carry on working. You take a lot of time off? Did um, you... I, had, I had four weeks. Oh, uh, after that, I, uh, I went, kind of helped do some... Um, some redesign of the, the the security on the ship just do some uh, upgrading the, the security to make the make it more secure and safe for people to hide out um should it happen again um so i was there for another couple of weeks and then i, I went home um four weeks off i think something like four weeks off and then back out yeah then back out again yeah yeah i suppose the weird one isn't it that is a weird one it's not your stereotypical kidnapping experience, is it? Not that it's, I know what the stereotypical kidnapping experience was. No, no, that was. I mean, it, a lot of it is is because they're just they are you know the people there are so poor. This is just, it's a business. It's a source of in, income. That's it. They know they're going to get paid. So, because the companies won't allow their people, you know, go, despite what governments say, they will. Governments will pay ransoms. But what happened with the Chennai Six, though? I think that was that was. Um, I'm not exactly sure. There was there, there, there there's something behind the scenes on that one that make that that's complicated. Yeah, but. yeah I had Nick I had Nick Dunn on the podcast, one of the early ones, and talked through the whole thing. It was a long old podcast that was as well. It was something to do with, if I remember correctly, something to do with. They were alleged it was falsified paperwork on the, on the weapons weapons uh, weapons documents, yeah. but uh, weapon certificates. But but um, there was no they wouldn't get them out. It took four years to get them out of, out of India. Yeah, you know, not not like an instant payment. I think no. it was very strange what was going on. Very strange. Yeah, I think because that because that was that was kind of state um, captivity. Oh, of course, yeah. Government. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, that, sorry, yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that that was that was a very complicated, long-winded. Yeah, part. good point. India arrested them, didn't they? India arrested them. No, it wasn't kidnapping by the pin pirates. Essentially, the same thing, though. Really, and it? it's just government organised. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, mate. On the uh, on that kidnapping team, there's pirates that came and got you. Yeah, um, I mean, and when you were um, when you were held in a very commas captive on your on your <laughs> nine days of nine days on the piss on that stag do, <laughs> how young were the? What was the youngest guys or or could have been girls that you saw were? Um, how would you term it? Fight uh, fighting age, fighting age males. What was the youngest fighting age male that you saw? I think the youngest was about fourteen. But sorry, that's the wrong term actually. But they were taking part in it. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Africa, mate. Africa, hard life. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter where you go in Africa. It's 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 kind of the same across the board. Is that when the second kidnapping happened as well? Yeah, the second one was in Nigeria as well. That was that was a different kettle of fish. That that was that I didn't I didn't enjoy that one. <laughs> <Go> on. 
<laughs> but that was yeah, that was really shit. That was a um, year later. That was a year later. Um, and that yeah, it was a weird start as well because I just we just moved house. My wife was pregnant with our daughter, and I had five days left basically to unpack as much as possible because she was eight months pregnant when we moved house. Seven, seven and a half, eight months pregnant, something like that. Um, I had five days to basically unpack the entire house so that she didn't have to, you know, lump boxes around and unpack shit and all the rest of it being so heavily pregnant. So did that, got got back to Nigeria, um, and within a few days it, it happened again. Um, and it was it was very different. This this yeah, this was they were they were they they were fucking came in all guns blazing. Were you guys armed? No, but we had there was there was Nigerian military securing supposed to be. Um, most most of them hid. Uh, one guy took a round off the back of his head and got called Terminator after that because um, <laughs> it took a, a gouge about that long at the back of his head. Um, one guy what got was, machete in the forearm, nearly lost his forearm. What was the boat? Just a box standard cargo ship? It was a... Uh, what the... F- no, it was... What the hell was it? It was... Um, like a offshore construction kind of thing. Oh, right. Uh, what time did they come? At night? About 11, half 11 at night, yeah. Talk me through it. What happened? Um... So the first thing I knew was was I could hear this familiar uh, sound of a of a rapid fire weapon, and it, I was like, "Oh, that's not good." Um, and it turned out they were firing; they're coming from both sides, and they were firing from both sides of this um, this vessel uh, with uh, firing four GPMGs. They fired two RPG rounds into it because the whole fucking thing just rocked. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I you know I managed to get pe- some people from the offices were upstairs on the main deck, main deck level. And I got people down in the accommodation, and as I was kicking people down the stairs to get out of the way, these guys came through the door. I was fucked. Um, and they they yeah they were they they it was very different from the from the get go. They you know I got booted to the floor, kicked, tied. Um, and then just dragged straight away as they were grabbing people they were just tying tying their hands behind their back and then um, passing them down the line it was almost you know it was well organised actually extremely well organised because they weren't pissing around it was just knock somebody to the deck give them a bit of a fill in tie them up pass them down the line then down into the boat um, and off (coughs) and then even search through the accommodation they went downstairs at the ship and, 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 yeah, picked people. How were they picking people? Oh, I found out afterwards. It was, um, it, as, as is often the case out there, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an inside job. So people in, in, the, in the expat crew on these ships, when they treat the locals like shit, all they do is they phone, phone home. And they go, right, this, this fucker lives in cabin, I know. 35 when you come in the main date you go to give them directions and they go and just go and boot the fucking door and drag them out no way yeah i didn't realize that was going on yeah flipping heck yeah it's all mostly inside information i i've known about stuff like that in iraq where um you know when you got the local nationals on your on your team in iraq it's a similar kind of thing but uh, that's the kind of thing you just get messed about like a police checkpoint and an extremist you'll get taken yeah. you know and get nicked and held for maybe a couple of days to be a, just to be a flipping knob to you but not organise a, a, a hijacking of a ship <laughs> oh my goodness me it's insane isn't it you know um, they were and it was this they weren't they weren't they were they were a bunch of shitbags to be quite honest, um, hardly any food, hardly any water. Um, 
you know, let, barely let out to go to the fucking toilet out of this hut. And there was five of us on this one. Um, and, yeah, it was just, just the whole atmosphere was different. Their whole behaviour was different. You know, they walk past you when you go, if you get let out to go for a, to go to the toilet, you know, if you were basically your ass over a log going for a dump, They'd walk up and punch you and knock you backwards into your own shit, you know, that sort of thing, and laugh at you. Um, and it got worse the longer it went on, because this lasted 35 days in the end. Um, and the longer it went on, the more pissed off they got that they weren't getting their money. Uh, and then they started taking it out on us. So it, it, it got to the point of daily beatings, especially at night time when they were, they were all getting pissed up around the fire. Oh, my God. Taking drugs and just... And they just... They were, we were getting um, beaten with a, they were coming up and beating you with a machete. So you, as in the flat side, you take it. The flat side, yeah, but in the state they're in, how nobody got seriously mutilated, I've no idea. Um, they were doing, they were, you know, take us out and just drag us around, kick the fuck out of us and throw us back in. You know, piss all over you and that sort of good stuff. And then they were doing mock executions in the last week. Oh my God. So, yeah. How were they doing that? Uh, they'd come out with pistols or AKs and you'd see a magazine and the weapon, but you didn't know what was in it. And they'd cock it and they'd, you know, they'd stick the bowel down the back, right down the back of your throat so that the foresight scra- scrapes the root, soft part of your mouth and poking you in the back of the throat with it. And, uh, and just laughing at you. And they're kicking you and, and then they'll just go, click. And they were doing the same with pistols, knock you to the floor. Kneel on your chest, stick the barrel in your mouth. Oh my god! Yeah, the first how, that, time, how often did that happen to you? The, that was, uh, the, the last week, in the last week, that was every day. About the last six, seven what days. Was the point, what was the point of them doing that? Just out of frustration for themselves. Yeah, they had no way, no way to vent. Otherwise, well, they did. They just decided to use us. What took the length of time to get the, for the negotiations to get you the money? I think it's. I think they asked for a, an extortionate amount of money in terms of uh, for the for the people who were paying it. <laughs> so they they were there was the the uh, standard negotiating down until they got to a point where they were happy, and then and I think they thought that thirty five days might might have been enough. I don't know. But yeah, it's just standard practice. You know, bring the price down as much as possible. Offer other things that don't cost as much that they need. Were you being held in the in their village? Yeah, awesome. yeah. All in one wooden hut. How was how did the uh, women and kids um, interact with you, if at all? Didn't they? Didn't didn't come? Nobody came near us. We just isolated. It was only the guys. How old were the guys? Well, again, teenagers up to, you know, 30s. Mate, I have to be honest, I'd be shitting myself. I, I, yeah. The thought of that, especially if we're on the ship and there are no weapons, that is the first thing. Knowing you get attacked and you've got no weapons and then getting taken off, my God. Because when you were talking through that, just that bit on the ship where they, you get, they tie you up and hand you back down the line, it's like, man, I've seen what, like, where African, you know, African gangs, African, you know, the West Side Boys, those, yeah, those hardcore, violent, very impoverished people. How they and how little value they put on human life out there. Mm-hmm. You know, as in in terms of emotional value for it, they just put a price on it. You know, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it wasn't. That was. You know, I mean. I, it, it bothered me for a little while afterwards, but not not too long. I would say after a couple of years, I was absolutely, you know, no problems talking about any of it. It's it's absolutely, you know, filed that one away. Don't want to do it again. It's on that list of things. Yep, done. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, I don't want to re- repeat on that one. What were you? What were they? Having, what are you having to eat? What were they feeding you? Oh, just uh, fish and pig. And just small amounts of it with rice. And that fucking awful 
orange, they call it Gary, stinks. It's made from this this root that they have to beat in, in water and because it's full of arsenic, naturally. So they have to beat it and soak it in the river and in water and get and soak all the arsenic out of it. But it's just, it's like, a, it's basically a filler. It's bugger all in it. I don't think I've tasted that. You don't want to. It stinks and it's just horrible, really. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> that was fun. Oh. Yeah, but, but, but very, very little water to drink. Must be like a skin and bone at the end of that. It was, yeah, I've, I've, I've been healthier. I think I'm more than made up for it now. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened after that? Again, <laughs> hand over in the same place, um, but this time on, on the like on the on the on the jetty. Um, and this time there were uh, Nigerian military, federal police, state police, uh, government officials, um, people from the, the the organization I was working for, uh, and yeah, money was money was handed over. Um, and then uh, money was taken out of the bag, given to the guys who took us, and the rest went away with the rest of them. Oh, what the officials? Yeah, Jesus Christ, Africa, they were on the, oh, they were on the take as well. Mm. TIA. TIA. TIA, but that I, what what was that feeling like that morning? Did, when did they tell you that you you, it was, you were getting released? When did you find out? Uh, just they was wasn't we weren't really told. We were just right, get up, get in the boat, and then off. But was that the first time they'd taken you anywhere in that thirty five days? Yeah, yeah. And as you, I'm not sure you can imagine, my my ass was going from like five p to dustbin lid. It was going. <laughs> it was going. It was a uh, yeah. That was that was a nerve wracking boat ride. I don't know. Well, I had no idea because didn't speak to us. Nobody spoke to us for thirty five days apart from yelling abuse at us. And so, were you allowed to speak to each other? Mm. Yes. All in, all in the same hat. How did the other guys cope with it? Varied, really. Um, there was a few meltdowns. Uh, but that that's kind of what kept me going was keeping them going because uh, I was the only one who'd had any military experience in, in amongst us the rest were they're all civvies oh man so yeah, yeah. no idea are you yeah. still in touch with any of us? no I'm not um, I well I did, I, I'd never met them before until I went on that boat and then you know I'd only but with the passage of time and all the rest of it, and just lost, lost touch. But uh... so, at this point, you've been kidnapped twice, second time for thirty-five days. Yes. Right, and then please tell me the third time wasn't on a boat because I would suggest that you should have thought I don't belong on <laughs> boats after this. Please tell no, me it, was, it wasn't on a boat. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the th- it was it was it was close to water, but it wasn't on a boat. It was on land. Um, this was actually in eastern east of Stockholm. Okay. Uh, in, in amongst the islands, where heading over towards kind of Finland and Russia, um, it was. Um, I was on a, on a on a on a job over there and. The person I was um, keeping an eye on, uh, there'd been some problems. There'd been some. He'd spotted, so I'd done some survey, anti-surveillance training with him, and uh, he uh, he spotted that somebody consistently following him. So he gave me a shout. So I went out to his house, had a look around, did a, did a, spent two or three days doing recce's around to keep an eye on things. Spotted this, these people that he described. Um, and I went to, and every night I was, I would clear around his house to make sure and just give him a, a quick text to say, you know, right, yeah, make sure everything's locked up, get your head down. And, um, this one particular night I was going around the back of his house in the, in, in the woods, because uh, I don't know if you've ever been to, to, to Sweden. I've not actually, no. 
well, out in the country in particular, where you've got the main road and then you've got these branches off and it literally branches off, it goes off and then you've got little side roads going to a single property. It's all like little offshoots of this main main road. Um, and it was woods all around. And uh, so I saw these guys, I saw, oh, shit. And I could see they had weapons. I, I again, there's a consistent, I didn't have any fucking weapons. Uh, well, nothing of any major value anyway. So I, I, I kind of quietly snuck back to my car, got in the car, and I was on the phone to say to, um, to my boss that, yep, this is genuine. We need to get him out of here. Um, and I, <laughs> this van screeched in front of my car. Guys got out on either side of the car and they had, um, yeah, they had uh, silenced MP5s and uh, just tapped on the window with the muscle of his weapon. It was like that. Like, so you dressed him for the phone yeah well get out of the car so i got out of okay. the car they smashed my phone um they took the car keys off me uh they took my jacket off me they kicked me all around this car park and threw me in the back of the van but they didn't cuff me tie me up they didn't hood me why is that do you think because uh, I think it was going to be—it was just a one-way trip. I think it's my my gut instinct was I'm not getting out of this one. Because when it, in the back of this van, you know the big tran- big box vans, yeah, and they had like um, benches over the wheel arches. So as I went in, it was uh, I got pushed into the left. The guy sat between me and the door, and there was another guy sat opposite me on the other side in the other corner, the far, uh, 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 like the cab end. I was just watching you, weapons yeah. on you. Right, and as I'm as we're bouncing, as the road the vehicles bounce on the on the road because it was snowing as well. Obviously. What were they wearing? Right? Uh, just dark clothing. What, dark clothing. Dark, just dark clothes, dark jeans, black jackets, what? balaclavas. Oh, they covered their faces. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking, how the fuck am I going to get out of this? <clears throat> um, and so. The only, I, I'm no, I, I still don't know why this popped into my head, but I thought the only way I can get out of this is to get out the back of this van. So, I, not that I had much saliva coming at the mouth, <laughs> mouth at that point in time because I was a little bit dry. Um, I let the saliva just let, lent forwards and just let the saliva build up my mouth, and the muzzle of his weapon was tapping against my leg as it was going along the road. So what I did, once I felt I had enough. I grabbed the muzzle of his weapon, lunged forwards, spat it in the face of the guy opposite me, and then shoulder barged, pushed his weapon out of the way and barged into the back door, let go and hit the lever, and we both fell out onto the road. Jesus Christ. Um, and his head hit, his head just went bang on the tarmac, even though there was snow, and it just, that was his head popped like a melon. So um, we, we rolled... Um, I popped my shoulder again, broke a couple of ribs um, on top of the ones I think that are already broken because it gave me a fairly hefty boot. Um, and I, when I stopped rolling, I just kind of and crawled into the woods and just went as far in as I could um, before they stopped. And just and I because it was all in in the woods in the in the trees. It was kind of like like ridges, almost like plow. So I rolled into one of these troughs and just covered myself and just laid there. Just hoped for the fucking best, really. Um, but there was still traffic going up and down this road, so they had basically I don't think we had much time to do much, really. They just I heard them shouting and having a little bit of a look around, but then they just heard the van door close and they buggered off. Jesus Christ, you were lucky there. Um, so yeah, I've. That of all of them, I think was was the one that put the shits up to me the most, and that was the last job I did. I, uh... I can I can see why, mate. It's a di- <laughs> different ball game. If there's one thing you know, we were talking about that um, West Africa lunatics, you know, West Side boys, gangsters, pirates, the gangsters, gangs, pirates, but 
this, this is a different level to when you're talking about Eastern European gangsters, <laughs> which is what I'm assuming when you're talking about here, you know. Um, and uh, and I was when you were talking through it there about in the back of the van, and you said, uh, you know, when, when the, 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 you realise the only way you're going to get out of that is going through the back door. It's one of the things I remember reading it years ago. I can't remember where I read it, but it was just a thing about a hostage situation. Um, do you know what? It might have been the Bravo to Zero book when I was a kid. It might have been that or something else. Anyway, the, the point is that when you get when, when you get captured, that's escaping evasion. What am I on about? Escaping evasion training. Flipping out. When you get captured, your best chance of getting away is like straight away. The, yeah. And the the longer the longer you leave your um, escape attempt. The further you get into the chain, into the you know the, the chain of, or the further you get into the the capture piece, the longer you're there. The deeper you get into the organisation, the harder yeah. it is to escape. Yeah, definitely. That was exactly, you know, but I didn't think I would get too far into the organisation. I think it was just too far into the woods and, or you know, somewhere quiet and one round in the back of the head and see you later. Did they get? Did they get the client? No. Why didn't they just kill you at the car park? Uh, I think they wanted to. I, I can only assume that they wanted to know what I knew. Ah, right. Okay. Um, but no, because I, I got the call out and said, listen, yeah, get him out. And it was as I was trying to give more information that they appeared. So the office got in touch with the, with the, with the, with the client and, and, he took his, uh, he just got in his car and fucked off and then followed the uh, prearranged plan. Jesus Christ, mate. Um, so yeah, that, that, of all of them, that, that scared the shit out of me the most. Actually, that, that one, that's made my heart rate go up talking about that. Is it? Yeah. When you, <laughs> when you, when you were sat in those woods, how long did you lay there before you were sure they'd fuck, fucked off? I must have laid there about an hour. Fucking freezing, because it was it was snowing. But early in, in in the woods, it was obviously it, it, it's a little bit warmer in, in the cover of the trees. But um, and then because part of the plan, I, I had a spare set of keys tucked underneath and, and fixed into the the wheel arch of the, of the car. So they, they didn't take the car; they just took the keys off me. I think. Um, so when I went back, the car was still there. So I got the keys, drove back into Stockholm, went to the apartment I was staying in, got on Skype. And this was like four hours later by the time I, I got back to the car and got into, because an hour's drive back into Stockholm at least. Um, so they're like, where the fuck have you been? <laughs> it's like, sorry, but. <laughs> Fucking hell. So I then went to the, the hotel that the uh, apartment was staying at, stayed in the same room as him, um, got cleaned up, and then we were on a flight to, to, to London the next morning. So, was he grateful or she grateful? Yes, very. <laughs> I can yes, yes. What was so? Was that going to be? I mean, I know you can't divulge any like information. What was the intent of the? Was the intent of the the criminals, the gangsters, to kidnap that person or execute that person? Um, certainly, or get information from it was. It was to. Uh, to kidnap in order to um, expedite release of funds that that uh, they they felt that they uh, deserved at that point. But yeah. <laughs> so yes, fully fully retired. <laughs> Was that the last job? Yeah, that was it. That was the last job I did, yeah. <laughs> How did that decision come about? <laughs> what did you go into? God, fucking hell. Um, well, I've been trying for about two years prior to that to, to, to get away from the line of work I was in. And uh, and I'd had an, uh, a possible option about 12 months before, but it never never came off. And it was... As I got home from that job, that was in March 2008, as I got home, um, 
I messaged a friend of mine. I said, are you, that, are you banging that table? Oh, that's me. Yeah, shit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Let's fucking talk about that bollocks. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, I found a friend of mine who I'd uh, been introduced to about 12 months. We had a mutual friend uh, and he was the, um, what was he, the title? Something like the drilling HSE manager for, for BG Group at the time in Aberdeen. And uh, he'd been kind of trying to get me get me on to a job. And he, I phoned him and he said, yeah, meet for coffee. He said, actually, your name's in the, I've put your name in the hat for a job. He said, come in, we'll have a coffee and we'll, we'll talk about it. Mm-hmm. So I did that. And then a week later, I had an interview uh, on a Thursday morning. And then Thursday afternoon, I got a, a call saying, yeah, job's yours. So within two weeks of that, I was then on a job doing uh, an, a drilling HSE job. On a on a on a uh, yeah on a, a rig in the North Sea for significantly more money. It was fucking great. So it was it kind of yeah serendipitous really. Yeah, no pirates in the North Sea, mate. Not normally. <laughs> 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 Smugglers, like but not, not pirates. <laughs> how did you how did you find that kind of work after going from the more um, volatile stuff if you like oh it's bliss absolute bliss all i had to deal with was uh stroppy scaffolders on a on a, on a construction site on, a, on an oil rig that was it it was it was easy could yeah it's no no drums at all it was good and i was with the psychological background that i have at that point it was um it was good because i was it was more about the team developing the team and 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 using the psychological aspect to, to help change the, the kind of the mentality of people offshore. Yeah. So it wasn't so much the health and safety side. It was more the, the mindset. Interesting. So when you say the mental health background, I thought you were referring just to your own experiences. Or no. I did it. No. Well, I studied sports psychology in the military. Uh, right. I found out I could, I could, I could, you know, didn't have to pay for it. So I thought, why, why not? It interested me. Uh, and then after that, I, I, so I, I did a, a bachelor's in sports psychology, uh, and I studied did a master's in behavioural, um, and I went on to study a PhD in counselling psychology. A master's in behavioural behavioural science. Psychology. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I, and the, along the way, I studied hypnotherapy and uh, NLP and um, behavioral coaching. Um, so I did a master's in that. And it was just, it's just a nice round mixed bag of tricks to, to use. Cause you know, there's no, there's no one, there's no one thing is useful for everything and everyone. So having a variety, lots of strings to the bow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how have you got to what you're doing now from the rig? In fact, what do you do now? Like, what do I do now? Uh, yeah. So now, uh, predominantly, um, well, in 2000, December 2017, I set up a mental health, a veterans mental health charity um, with a friend of mine. Icarus. Icarus, yes. So we started that December 2017. And... It's just grown arms and legs, and in particularly this year, we've and we've 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 come a long way in a short space of time. From just the two of us, there's now in total on the team there's 16, um, 15. Because unfortunately, we lost our psychiatrist earlier this year. He died after a short illness, which was um, shit. Because he was a, a really really good guy um, and a good friend. Um, so we're 15, but we took on about 10 different, 10 new therapists this year because of, mostly because of lockdown. Uh, we expanded rapidly. Uh, due to demand, I'm assuming? Yes. So <clears throat> where, where is that demand increased from? What, what sort of well, area of the population? Because we started off treating just veterans, but now it's in, in, in uniform services. But we we incorporated the NHS because we'd heard from quite a few people that that the NHS weren't 
in a position at that point to be able to help their own staff as much as they might want to just drain on resources because of the pandemic it's just you know it's a shit situation for everybody um so we expanded to include the nhs as well um so that obviously upped our workload <laughs> um and ironically you know in 2018 we treated 207 people 2019 we treated 425 and ooh, in fact i can give you so i'm not talking complete crap i can ballpark it's all right people know this people know yeah. some absolute rubbish spoken on you <laughs> <laughs> It is five hundred and seventy three people we treated this hmm. year. Eight months in. No, seven months in. So uh, NHS wise, it, um again, so what 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 kind of people are you treating there? What like nurses? Yeah. Who, nurses. Doctors, uh, yeah, the old, you know, the kind of the auxiliary staff as well. And what's what? What's the issue? Is it what's a uh, lot? Of, what's you know the big cause of the issues there? Is it what? What, what is it? Is it is it exhaustion? Or, you know, as in mental strain? Yeah, it is. It's it's it's. I think it's it's almost it kind of equates in its own way to being on the front line. You know, like being in the trenches or being in a fob and you're there and you're getting battered every day. Every morning you wake up and every time you go on shift, you're just getting battered. That's essentially what's been going on. And there's so much, you know, at one period, there was so much death on a daily basis. Um, and just, you know, an upset, you know, families not being able to see the people that are in hospital waving through a window or at, at best not being able to be with them when they when they when they die yet the the hospital staff are and it's i think it's just this volume in a short space of time of death has has hit a lot of people you know and it, it's it's the fallout after you know it's like when you're on tour it's not so bad you know you just get on with it you're doing your job but when it, in, it's in the quiet time afterwards when you get home and you're like what the fuck do i do now I'm, you know, I don't even know what, what, what happened in those last six months. Got no idea. It was shit at times. But it, and it, and it kind of, kind of filters into your, to your, your, your consciousness as what's actually happened. And that's when it starts to really sink in and kick in. Um, and I think that's what's, that's what's happening now. Hmm. Well, I was um, I I I inc I'd forgotten about that. Not forgotten. I think I when you were talking about the increase with COVID nineteen, I was just, it. I, I mean, I thought of the general population at first. Thought, oh. One of the things I I thought when it started off is that there was that pe people would assume it's going to be massive loads of mental health issues with just the general population because of everything going on with COVID. But then people tend to cope better in times of hardship as a population. Yes, and actually. You know, thing in in general, mental health can improve. You know, um, I've spoken about it before. There's this when the Second World War was going on, and they were they were facing the the Blitz, the Blitz, the the, the, the British government knew there was, there was a, a huge you know attack or repeated attacks to be going on in London and across the UK in the Blitz, and they start preparing for the worst like flipping neck and people are going to the hospitals are going to be overrun the mental health places are going to be overrun what do they call them back then it's like, yeah the the, the, uh, the, men, the mental homes are going to be overrun and it's going to be a real issue and suicides are going to go through the roof because people are going to be so afraid and what they actually found in retrospect when they look back on it what they actually found was um that uh the uh, alcohol alcohol uh, consumption decreased Mm -hmm. um, the mental homes they experienced a decrease in people ending up in them mental health in general in general improved because people yes. had a they're all united under a common goal a common hardship which I thought about the same in terms of 
COVID-19. I didn't, you know, I'm not comparing it to the Blitz. I am in some way, but not the severity of it. Yes. So that's what they thought. But, um, but yeah, it makes sense for the NHS. Absolutely. That, that, those guys and girls, flipping neck. I interviewed um, an NHS nurse um, a couple of months back. Um, and she, uh, yeah, she was talking through it, man. Just hard work. And they work hard anyway, right? Just they work hard. Right, they do. Yeah. <laughs> but what you were referring to in terms of that increased strain earlier is that instead of going, you going your, your shift and just having you know your normal run of the mill dealing with patients, and then there might be a a, a, a very emotional or traumatic in inverted commas event where not oh, not even that. I mean where someone dies, for example, they were looking after someone dies, and yeah, it happens every so often but you know um it's not happening all the time and then you go into the covid situation they're going to work and you've got every flipping hour every half hour one of those one of those real emotional incidents happening bang spike someone dies bang spike yes. family comes in and see their the kid and they can't see the kid because they have to be socially distanced and bang you know they've they've, they've haven't got enough staff to work so you have to do an extra hour on shift and that's not happening anymore it's just constant high 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 pressure yes it's it's been it's been a it's been a really tough time for the NHS, without a shadow of a doubt. How long do you see it continuing on for this? Uh, if this sort of mental impact on them? Well, I th- I th- it's it's it kind of it's like anything, you know. When 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 it calms down, there's a bit of a lull, and it starts to pick up because we found that with with the veterans that we treat, everything the first four to six weeks of lockdown. <laughs> doing great and then after that there were the 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 wibbles started to creep in (laughs) and guys guys and girls started to uh you know start to lose a little bit because it was a bit i think it's because there was no end in sight you know when you're on a tour you know you're going to get your r and r and there's a break point there and you and you get you can have some respite and then you know the end of the the tour is going to last six it may get extended another month or whatever so it's six or seven months you know there's an end point with this people don't see an end point yet because it's been so vague and slightly flaky and i think that that's had a had a detrimental effect on on some people's mental health because they just don't see an end to it yeah it can be difficult as well to to have all that to be able to deal with all that spare time yeah 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 you know, um, because all of a sudden you you have you, you have to deal with your own brain and his own thoughts because nothing else is occupying it. And a lot of people they keep themselves busy to as a not as a conscious means of doing it, but potentially but maybe, but as a means of just staying away from you know that brain open thinking danger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for people who who live on their own and then they've been furloughed or just can't go to work because of the nature of their job, for whatever reason, they're not getting furloughed. Um, and they live on their own and they're in their own space all day, every day, got no company. That's going to be hard. What did you think about the government's decision to let alcohol still be sold? I don't know. I think it's a tough one to try and go into like prohibition in a pandemic. It's not prohibition, though, is it? No, it's, it's stop it, alcohol. Just stop. It's, just be, it, it's but that's that's fun. kind of that's that's just kind of a, you know a kind of a correlation between when you when you stop people doing something that they want to do because it's you know it should be their choice. People will find a way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just from just from a mental health perspective, uh, you know, um, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, South Africa stopped it. You couldn't buy alcohol in South Africa. Yeah, when they were when they when they were on complete lockdown. Yeah, um, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what what impact that had in terms of mental health side of things. But they also they did, they did some bonkers stuff actually. One of the other things they did was they said they like they said right, we're going to allow people to exercise every day. Um, 
but you you can have three hours. There's a three hour window, six a.m. to nine a.m. That is when your window to exercise is. So they're telling everyone. So basically, you end up <laughs> everyone out. Everyone went out between six and nine a.m. This mad. mad. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, I used to keep away from people. The whole country's out. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit odd to put it mildly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, there's, um, I don't know. I, you know, there's pros and cons for it, isn't there? Definitely. I think it's saving grace not being able to access alcohol for some people when their mental health is bad already and they're already, but if this is the, this is where it gets difficult is if somebody's already relying on alcohol and then you tell them they can't have the one thing that they think keeps them going is, and it might be dangerous for some people to just stop and not have alcohol. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah for the extreme it, alcoholic. But, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a tough one. And I'm sure being <laughs> with Britain have having such a heavy drinking culture, I could see a massive kickback from that. Mm, yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, I think, do you know what I think I would, I would do if I was the boss? Or I could do it. Um, I could do it without any worry. I'd just ban it. I would. I'd ban alcohol. I'd ban, I mean, I like a drink. I like to see there's pros in it, you know, re- reduces yeah. social inhibitions for some people, gives us a bit of a confidence boost, but there's so many negatives to it. So many negatives. It's so easy for it to for it to succumb to it physically or mentally. You know, no, my, you know, you've got the disease aspects. Yeah. And got, well, and you've got the mental disease aspects. You know, don't know. Yeah, it is. It's you know, there's. But I guess it's it's the same as same as anything. It's how how you use it, isn't it? Correct. But then, if we're going to ban alcohol and ban cigarettes, yeah. Why on earth? Why on earth are we like to sell cigarettes? Why on earth are people like to buy cigarettes? Mental. Mental. Are you smoking? No, I used to, but I stopped years and years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I, I cottoned on to the fact that it was shit early on, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> I have a cigarette every, every now and again. Yeah, every now and again. I used to smoke all the time. But what's uh, have you had to expand your staff this year for for or recently for Icarus to cope with the situation yeah in in april we we went we, uh, we took on 10 new therapists how how are they do they like are they like full time uh well everybody like myself and my my partner in crime david bellamy we're all volunteers so um we just in and around you know work and home life you kind of fit people in to 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 deal with them um but we have a very a very efficient system that means that when somebody gets in touch with us one of the team will be in touch with them the same day generally well if it's late at night they get in touch it'll more than likely be the next morning but usually within 12 to 24 hours one of the team's been in touch with them uh and organizing uh to get them started We've got on the website. We've got we've got um, we've got the usual kind of get in touch with us kind of thing. Um, we've got uh, a patient referral, so other organisations can ref- like the bigger the other charities like SAFRA and RBL and all other organisations that pass people to us, um, so we can get a referral form. We've got our intake form is on the website as well, so people can once people get in touch with us, we then direct them to the website, fill in the intake form, and it gives us a full history. And there's, we've got three standard assessments, that mental health assessments that the NHS uses. So it's everything's transferable between us and the NHS and others, you know, other specialists that we might refer people to. Um, mm-hmm. So it just, it speeds things up. It's all about ease of access. And we do most of our stuff via Zoom. Um, what what gap are you plugging when you decided to start up Icarus? Speed of access to treatment, uh, particularly at crisis point. You know, if you access to treatment in in the UK varies from six months to two and a half years. So if somebody, that's crazy. Yeah. So if somebody's suicidal and they go to hospital because they've cut themselves or they've overdosed, or they've tried to hang themselves and they've been found in time they'll get assessed in hospital then they may do a few days in a in a in a psych ward but then they'll get sent home 
but never resolving the issue. It's mad, isn't it? I, I had a mate. Um, I use, I use uh, past tense because he killed himself. Um, and he went and visited. Well, he got didn't visit. He he got referred to a mental health charity. Um, and then four months later, he he hadn't he hadn't been he hadn't had a proper consultation. I think uh, and ended up killing himself. Yeah, mental. I'd already tried. He tried it twice before already. It's, yeah. it's just it's just mad. I mean, uh, I can understand why why the delays are there, what causes the delays. But, but the workaround they should be they should be you just just needs to be improved. I mean, that, you know that. And like you're saying, it's just that s- speed of contact straight away. Get in touch with the person yeah. straight away. That, you know, human contact with someone who's got an interest in what what your what your issue is you know what your plight if you like your mental plight um and that could be enough to to stop them having those thoughts or or following through them it's one of the things that makes a single biggest difference is having that because most people say to us holy shit i wasn't expecting to hear from you this week (laughs) and that could be on a monday yeah you know, it it makes no difference. So, um, so that's that's the, that's the biggest biggest. That was the, that was the reason we started. We started with no plan other than to plug that gap, and we've successfully done that. We've got a system in place that works really efficiently. The first thing we do, we got. I, I designed a process. I called it the immediate care process. Um, and we're, I, I right now run a training course on it to train other people. The idea is to train other veterans to help other veterans. So we, t- we, 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 I designed this immediate care process uh, with three tangible self-regulation tools to manage your psychological and your emotional state, so you can keep yourself on an even keel. How long's the course? Three days. Where'd you run that? Um, oh, we've run it all over the country, from uh, London to Dumfries so far, uh, and it's it's one of those things. It's it's. I can, I can do it via Zoom or via video this this way, but it's one of those things that's much better done face to face because then I can kind of give pointers at, at the time and it's it's easier to manage. So tell me, give me a taste of what kind of stuff it teaches. It sounds interesting. Um, so the three tools are um, one. The first step is called a negative thought pattern interrupt, which kind of does what it says in the tin. It breaks. It disconnects. The, the emotions and the feelings that a person currently has connected to those tr- problematic thoughts and memories. The second step is called whole brain state, which is about bringing, because the negative thought patterns create a, essentially, you know, high speed. It, you, you can feel it in your brain and your, your mind and your body. Everything's spinning so fast. So this slows your brain speed down, gets you into the, the right, your, your brain into the right, frequency to uh, kind of take that step back and see things objectively uh, and then and, and bring up about a state of, kind of mental and physical calm and then the third step is called is 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 a simple anchoring technique where we anchor that current experience of feeling mentally and physically calm and relaxed to a simple gesture a simple action so it's a stimulus response uh, and we teach those, and we so it, we ex- typical military stuff, EDIP. When you teach them, you do <laughs> so explain it, demonstrate it. Then they we get them, we talk, walk through, talk through, and then so that they actually experience it working in the very first session, and then they know how to use it. And we say, right, we'll chat again in how whatever we decide on with that person is the next when the next session is. But basically, practice those things. A minimum of three times a day for the next 30 days mm-hmm. so that they ingrain it and make it second nature it's like getting rounds down range you can't be a good you can't be a decent shot and good marksman if you don't practice yeah yeah no it's interesting i'll have to have a, have to have a look at that um... i'll send you i'll send you the some some stuff yeah, I sent it through because one of the, I mean, one of the challenges is with anyone, not just military folk, but with anyone who got a, who, who have a, a friend or a colleague who's, um, 
struggling who struggles mentally more yeah. than more than others everyone struggles at some point and probably regularly just yeah more than others is that uh is one identifying that that's going on i think seeing you know being able to read signs in someone that something's not got great yeah. um and the second thing is understanding how to deal with it you know it's only through my my own experiences and then learning from people like yourself and others um and, and going through that mill is that I'm a lot more perceptive to the way people are now and the, their, yeah. their mental state. Don't see everyone as a basket case, but um, <laughs> you know. But he, he's definitely can definitely see. It, I'm just. I think more. I'm. It's, it's. I mean, I can see changes in people easier, or I can see where people are just. There's something. There's something hammering them. You know, some, yeah. something uh, there. On the surface, it looks fine, but there's something not quite right, you know. And it's little things. It's not just, you know, it's, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of physical cues and, 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 and yes. physical indications and um, social interaction or lack of, and you know. Yeah. But but I'm sort of lucky on that part, like you are, in terms of we've been there. We we've been exposed to more information, so we can see it a bit better. But a lot of people don't have that. They don't understand it. And the more people that do understand it and are able to help from the outset, then the less people are going to uh, feel shit mentally overall and the less people are going to yes. end up wanting to top themselves, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, abs- absolutely. You know, this is, this is, this stuff is, it's simple to learn. It's so simple to learn. And I'll give you the, the, prime, the best example of, and I only ever used, with this, with this particular guy, I only ever used the first step, which is his negative thought pattern interrupt. Because this guy got my number from somebody else, uh, and he he phoned me, he FaceTimed me at half one in the morning, and he had about that much left in uh, a litre bottle of vodka, which he was drinking. Um, and it turned out he was stood on a chair with a noose around his neck. And he looked down and saw the bit of paper with a number on it and thought, fuck it, I've got nothing to lose. I'll just make one more phone call. So I spent about 45 minutes talking to him, finding out what was going on, why he got to this point, you know, and, and I said, listen, I've got, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain, I'm going to describe something to you, and I think you might, under, you, it might kind of, you know, strike a chord with you. I said, your head right now is spinning a million miles an hour, like a big, massive tornado. I said, the more you try and stop it, the worse it gets. The more other people try and stop it, the worse it gets. It's like you feed it. It gets bigger, darker, stronger and faster. He's like, yep, that sounds about right. I said, I've got a really simple. I said, all that, it's just a negative mind game that this thing is playing with you. It's just got in a routine of looking at worst case all the time. I've got a really simple game that we can play, a positive mind game that will counteract that and stop it. Do you want to? Do you want to just test it out? Since you've got nothing, you know, worst case, it's going to just take up five minutes of time and then we'll, we'll have a bit of a giggle. It's like, yeah, sure. So I explained it to him and you run this process in, in loops to reduce the intensity of these emotions and feelings that somebody's experiencing until they get to either a comfortable level or it kind of disconnects completely. And I, I ran three 20 second loops with him of running this exercise and at the end he stopped each time at around about 20 25 seconds because he started laughing and the third time i said listen do you want to take that noose off your neck before you fall off and fucking hang yourself accidentally (laughs) he just he laughed again he went yeah he just took it off i said sit down put the vodka over there and that was the only thing I ever did with him. I mean, that and that's that is not by no means the norm. That was that was exceptional circumstances, extreme circumstances, um, and it's the only person that I've ever had to do just one technique with. But after that, and he's now he's got a new new girlfriend, new flat, new job. He's on the up, and he's he's doing really well. For some re- for some people. It's just having, as you said, that human contact, even through a screen, talking to somebody who understands where you've been, what's going on, and that you actually give a shit. That's the biggest, we have to wrap it up in a minute, but that, that's the biggest thing I remember when, um, 
uh, I remember when I'd be at my lowest. Um, and, yeah, there's people who care for me and or care about me. And when, depending on who, I get a call or I get a text and it would say, oh, how are you? You know, for example. And if that came from someone who was non-military, um, I just, I didn't, it wouldn't even get a reply. Because mm-hmm. it's just like, because I wanted to be honest, but it wouldn't even get a reply. Because, because, it, I, because in my head, it's how can I even explain to you? You don't understand. And that subconscious thing. Um, and I had a mate, I've got a mate, and he would, he got a point, that would be the interaction. I get a text, he, he just text me regularly, how are you? And I, and I just, I'd reply back, um, you know, if I, if I was, having, if I was real bad, I'd reply, I'd make myself reply back, I'm shit. Bit shit, a bit shit at the minute, and then he'd call, and he'd call me at some point, probably straight after, and he wouldn't talk about, um, he wouldn't talk about why I was feeling shit, he wouldn't talk about all that. He would just be, he would just be chat. He'd just try and chat to me, and I was in no me- mood to chat. I was in no mood to chat. Yeah. The reason we did that is we, I'd agreed with him before that he said, right, if I ring, you answer the phone, no matter what. I said, okay, and he would just talk. He's and he'd try and get me in a conversation, and he'd say, you know, I, I was tricks. You know, I had the kids. And I, I'd be one word answering him. Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, all good. Yeah, but the mere fact it's on the end of the phone is this did something because I knew we had got a similar background. So I so straight away there, there's a there's an un, you know, there's an unwritten, uh, unspoken understanding. Yes. Um, and I was, and I was willing, uh, and it was almost like a, a sort of a, a slight, a, like a release in a way, just because I was sort of, he understood that I was not good at the minute, um, and I had, you know, I was doing a good thing by speak, engaging with him, not that I was, but I was speaking to him on the phone. Yes. And that was enough for me sometimes just to get myself up a notch. Yeah. You know, and then which because when you get up a notch, then the next notch is even closer. You know, it's like it's just little things like that. Whereas with the other, you know, the, the non the non military, there's no I couldn't engage it. There was no there was, there was no relief there. There was no nothing because I just felt like I didn't understand, rightly or wrongly. You know, and it, I, again, I'm not just going about the military. It's a lot of people like the NHS and the fire service, police. You know, they'll interact with people outside of that organization in terms of how, how, how honest and how, uh, yeah, how honest they're willing to be with people in a completely different way to people inside the organization. It's very tough. And it's very hard to explain because when you try to explain it to people outside, so when you, I'm saying this and maybe the civilians listening, it's very hard to say that in a way that doesn't sound like, oh, well, that's because civilians are uh, less valuable than military. No, it's not. It's, 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 a, you know, it's just a circumstance. It is, oh, there you go. It's exactly the same way. And a mother can talk to another mother about um, about childbirth and that whole experience of being a mother in a very different way. They can talk to a man about it. Two different conversations. Yes, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, no, that's, and, that's, that's a, yeah. You're going to use that when your courses, aren't you? Pregnant <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, yeah, that, 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 that's a good. It's, spin. An, it's an analogy. It is. It's very good. Yeah, yeah, mate. We're gonna have to knock in the head, even though I was yes, just speaking for the last three minutes. Listen, tell me, tell tell people about Icarus. Okay, Icarus is a mental health charity for veterans and all uniform services in the UK uh, and NHS. Um, we expanded that way because UK veterans are in all of those services, um, and they're quite naturally drawn to it, uh, uh, quite typically. So. Um, we do we provide fast access to treatment usually via video call if if uh, if one of the therapists is close enough and it's feasible and safe enough to do it we'll under the circumstances we'll do face to face as well uh, just not naturally as close as before <laughs> there's no, there's no there's no fuck, there's no touchy feely therapy anymore <laughs> it's um uh so and it's really really easy to to get going, most of them are male and female are either veterans themselves or married to a veteran or someone who is still serving. Uh, it's a very quick system 
um, easy to find us. It's IcarusOnline.net, I-C-A-R-U-S, online.net. Easy peasy to find us. Phone number's on there. There's a get in touch with us form you can fill in if you want to chat to us um, or just pick up the phone and you will speak to more than likely. We've got a, a filtering system to so uh, we use an outside company to, to, to field the calls and then the person that calls back uh, and triages all of them is, is actually my father who was a Royal Marine as well. Oh, amazing. And he is absolutely brilliant with people when they are in an absolute shit state. He's just a real calming energy and uh and a voice of experience so yeah they'll speak to that mad old bugger <laughs> who, is absolutely, <laughs> who is absolutely brilliant <laughs> are you on social media as well yeah it's uh facebook twitter and instagram although we're just kind of getting going with the other two but mostly facebook it's icarus online uk for all three of them perfect mate it's been an absolute pleasure yeah likewise it's been good to speak to you since we uh if you met that um, thing at the BSC last year, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we'll uh, we'll have to catch up for a uh, we'll have to get together for a non-prohibition beer. All right then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you yeah. I'll definitely give you a shout because I've got yeah. I've got I've got some some travels to do. So yeah, I'm I'm sure we can manage something. Perfect. Listen, cheers to out, mate. Uh, no, cheers to out. Cheers to the conversation, mate. And um, good luck it. with the Chris. Yeah, likewise, dude. Just uh, take it easy, and uh, yeah, no doubt we'll chat again at some point. Perfect. Catch <laughs> right. a bit, bud. Take it easy. Bye.